please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hand together to Manager of Environmental Strategy and Ampera for Vauxhall Motors, Ian Allen. Ian. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Quentin. <laughs> no money was exchanged uh, for, for any of that, uh, I hasten to add. Um, and again, what a beautiful venue. Um, this, this job takes me into some very auspicious um, venues, um, and this has to be rank, um, uh, uh, up there among them. Although I am going to avoid any um, references and puns um, which you would normally expect to hear and hit the presentation head on. So, you'll see that I am, uh, work for Vauxhall Motors, but I'm also the um, chairman of the EV committee at the Society of Manufacturers and Traders, which means that today's presentation will be, let's say, an industry presentation with a Vauxhall slant, or maybe a Vauxhall presentation with, with an industry slant. You'll have to wait and see. But I guess one of the things that we have to ask ourselves and that you might be asking yourselves and that the whole fleet industry will ask themselves, well, why should transport managers bother with electric vehicles? Most EVs are more expensive than conventional ones, and if you look at the capital cost in, actually, yeah, they are, if you compare vehicles in the same segment. There are anxieties about range that we've talked about. You know, am I going to get stranded on, on my journey? Is there a charging point where I can recharge mid-journey? There's a lack of infrastructure to support the, the longer journeys that people might want to take. Um, and I guess I'll come back to the Northern Ireland situation a bit, a bit later. And certain parts of the media, as both all speakers have referred to, remain, let's say, unconvinced at best. And of course, I hear this phrase from some of the fleet guys that we meet that actually no one ever got sacked for fleeting a diesel because fleet managers are there to, if you like, deliver efficiency on their fleet. So are electric vehicles right for everybody? No, but you know what? They might be. So why should decision makers bother? Well, three simple phrases. EVs are here now, as you can see out there in the car park today and the vehicles that you're able to drive, and those are by no means the only electric vehicles which are available in the market today. They're here to stay. The amount of money that's been invested in the development of these vehicles, in the infrastructure, the, the way that the government, uh, both local and national, have got behind this campaign, they're here to stay. It's not going away. And the number of EVs on our roads will grow. There is no getting away from it. It's here to stay, and we're on the road already. We've got challenging targets to meet. As manufacturers, we have to get down our CO2 emissions of our, of our vehicles, of our vehicle fleet. That's what we have to do. The government has got various um, uh, emission targets to, to hit in reducing their CO2. And we do this through the pound in people's pocket, actually. So it's not just about saving the polar bears. It's not just about the fact that fossil fuels are, are running out and becoming harder and harder to get out of the ground. It's also to do with the carbon reduction targets and also the, CO, the, the air quality targets that the EU has put in place. And we won't be able to do this through combustion engine technology alone. As manufacturers, we try and reduce our CO2 emissions as much as we possibly can and drive up the MPG of our conventional vehicles. But we won't do it without working together. And what do I mean really by, by working together? That's working together as an industry with government. I, I've never really known a, a more a fraternal um, group of people than, than the EV committee at the SMMT. Um, it, Although we're in competition, and I'd prefer to see a lineup at the Vauxhall stand rather than the Renault stand today, I see more of Andy from Renault than I care to mention at the moment because of the way that we all work together and we realise that actually it's in all of our best interest to work together in making this thing work. And consumer choice is also widening. You may actually think that there's only a, a small number of players in the market today. It's Vauxhall, it's Renault, it's Nissan, it's Mitsubishi, Peugeot, but actually as well as the vehicles that are already on the market today, we'll actually see some more people come in to market. Some more manufacturers, some premium manufacturers that are now realising that they are having to come into the market maybe later than other people, but the choice is widening, the segments that these vehicles are appearing in will be widening, and of course the, the uh, attractiveness of some of these vehicles 
brings in other people to be EV considerers. They're not milk floats, they're not golf trolleys anymore, they're actually really exciting fuel efficient vehicles and over the next 18 months we'll have more than 30 plug-in vehicles um, available for people to buy. And the uptake will rise. The market at the moment is very small, around about 1% of the, of the vehicle market at the moment. Is that where we want it to be at this stage? Probably not. But that market will grow. You see on there, there's lots of different technologies on there, from the combustion engine vehicles at the bottom, to the EVs, the LPG, the CNG, and right up to the hybrids, the plug-in hybrids, the range extenders, and, and also the, the um, fuel cell hydrogen vehicles. So the, the vehicle market will grow for EVs most definitely. How, how fast that will be, whether we'll reach our 4% by 2020, actually everybody's reassessing all the markets at the moment, but I think we're all, we're all convinced that, that vehicles, vehicle take-up will grow. And then there's this government technology roadmap, which you may see in other presentations today. Uh, underpinning that is a great improvement in the combustion engine vehicle efficiency. But as we move up the technology roadmap, it's all about electricity. It's all about how we bring electricity to add to the fuel efficiency of the vehicles and make them less fossil fuel reliant. We've already got the hybrids, we've already got the plug-in hybrids and the range extenders, and we'll be up to the fuel cell vehicles probably over the next five years. Fuel cell vehicles represent a bit of a different type of challenge to us because it's a very much a, a chicken and egg situation. Who's going to buy a hydrogen vehicle without anywhere to fill it up? And who's going to put a hydrogen fueling tank on their forecourt with no vehicles to use it? So working with the, the government under the UK H2 consortium, you know, we're trying to work out how, how that will happen. But as you see there, the future will include multiple technologies. There is no silver bullet solution. Different manufacturers trying different technologies, but electricity will be a major component through all of those. So let's get back to those questions then. Why should we bother? Why should we bother with EVs? They're more expensive. Well, in actual fact, for some people they may be. But everybody has to do their sums. Because you know what? It might be. You might be an EV customer, but without looking into it, you're actually never going to know. Of course, we as manufacturers will try and tell you that you may be. We also sell other vehicles, of course, that, you may, that may be more appropriate for you. The Energy Savings Trust did a recent focus on the called their Plugged In Fleets initiative, where they compared different vehicles um, with combustion engine vehicles. And this is an Ampera compared to a BMW for a particular fleet, for that particular job role, for that particular routing. And actually, as a company, they saved over a thousand pounds in their in their cycle. And as a as a driver, the company car driver, because of the benefit in kind saving, actually saved about four thousand pounds over the three years. Now that worked for them, and they did their sums. So for actually for them, a particular type of EV works. But until you try and find out, then you'll never know. Using different manufacturers, there are different access to tools that you can use. We've got fleet sales managers, we've got retailers, Charles Hurst obviously in, in Northern Ireland as our Ampera specialist dealer, but also facilities on, our, on the website. Uh, as I say, there'll be various independent websites, and we provide a toolbox on our fleet website to say, OK, well, you can go and compare a Vauxhall to any other vehicle on that website to see if that works for you, because it won't work for anybody, but you won't catch anything. might catch Barney's cold after being up here after him, but to be honest, you won't catch anything just by considering whether you're an electric vehicle customer or not. Range anxiety. The vast majority of fleet vehicles, the Energy Savings Trust study found, make regular and predictable journeys. And if you make regular and predictable journeys, taking Northern Ireland as an example, it might be that on that route where the guy stops for lunch, there might be a rapid charger that you can fill up on. So do you need a hybrid? Do you need a plug-in hybrid? Do you need a range extender? Actually, you might be able to get away with a pure battery vehicle. So understanding the route that people go on, how much it comes back to depot maybe, whether people have got the ability to charge at home, where the vast majority of charging will take place, or whether you can actually charge en route. And how many miles do you do a day? If you only do less than 100 miles a day, then potentially an electric vehicle is fine for you. Over 100 miles, maybe a plug-in hybrid or an EVREV. Over 200 miles, you're into hybrid territory or efficient diesel territory, to be honest. 
right customer, right product. We cannot force people to take them because that will turn them off right from the start. So are you a pure battery vehicle customer? Are you a hybrid customer? Or are you an extended range customer? You may notice a couple of plugs in this, and I guess that might be the first one, but I'll gloss over that quite quickly. Infrastructure. And Northern Ireland is an excellent example where the infrastructure is there now. There's no excuse with regards to where can I charge my car while I'm out on the road. Yes, the vast majority of charging will take place in the home because that's where the vehicle is stored for a lengthy period of time when not being used. So ideally, when you get up in the morning, to have 50, 100 miles on your battery is the ideal way to start your day. In terms of the government, the government put a huge amount of money behind creating that infrastructure. And as I say, the, the Northern Ireland example is a great shining example to show what can be done. Obviously, the geographical area of the country um, lends itself to, to that kind of structure. Interoperability as well. Buying, buying, getting into government schemes which only apply to a certain part of the country, again, turns people off. So making them interoperable is a key part of that. And I know we're moving towards that on the mainland UK and, and it already exists here in, in Northern Ireland. So infrastructure, extremely important. But I guess what we would say is after the, the test beds of the PIPs, the plugged in places areas, we're now moving on to, to the next level to say, OK, let, let, let's start to take it to, to the next level. Media coverage, as Quentin pointed out, um, it has been questionable in some cases. Um, the BBC journalist who took a mini E um, from London to Edinburgh it took him four days. Well, that's unsurprising. It's not designed to do that kind of journey. And those, um, oh, those wacky boys over on Top Gear decided, of course, to run a Nissan um, into the ground before it ran out of charge, allegedly in a, in a very unpopulated area of Lincoln, which happened to be populated by a huge number of students. And people say to me, actually, isn't this brilliant for Ampera? Well, yes and no. For the initiated, maybe. But for the top gear viewing public, the, this just reinforces their inbred attitude that actually electric vehicles will all run out of charge they're not, for me, the infrastructure doesn't exist. I am not an EV customer. So what do we need to get over that? Well, we need positive stuff in the media, positive stuff like this, where actually, in a, in a fairly surprising place, we have positivity uh, about the, a person who has saved 2,000 pounds on the use of, it, of his electric vehicle. Again, referring to the fact that he doesn't have to visit a petrol station on a regular basis. So he's happy about that. Other more um, uh, motoring areas, and obviously the Sunday Times and Top Gear as well, to make comments about the car, and we don't say this, it has to be independent, it has to be people who are coming out and actually saying this about the car from an independent basis to, if you like, counter the negativity and actually say, do you know what? I was able to live with this, I worked with this, and it was fine for me. In fact, I saved some money by doing it. And the, and the photograph of an Auto Express journalist stashing money into a piggy bank, well, to be honest, we couldn't have written it any better. And getting back to the thing, nobody ever got sacked for fleeting the diesel. And that's true. And it's true that you will need high level buying in an organisation to actually come up with the actual reason that you are considering an electric vehicle. Because it's not necessarily purely economic. The economics will work for some and maybe not for others. But a lot has got to do with the brand image. Do I want to be green? Do I want to reduce my carbon footprint? Do I want to be seen to be green and being seen to reduce my carbon footprint? And then we have this thing about being involved in the electric age. This is a, an absolutely superb industry to be working in. 22 years I've worked in this industry and, and over the past two or three years to be, include, to be involved in this is almost like going back to the start and being involved in a completely new industry. So being involved, being there at the start and from the start. And we're talking about pioneers here. And, and obviously, I didn't know that you were going to be here, Quentin, when I put this presentation together. Honest. Um, but, you know, people who you don't necessarily expect to be supporters who actually are. And I know it's a bit unusual to use a, an England footballer as an example here, but that quote there... You know, when you associate, when you think about footballers' cars, you don't think about electric vehicles necessarily. And Gary Neville driving into the Man United training ground, driving a, a Toyota Prius, 
with all the Bentleys there, the, the Range Rovers and the Porsches and whatever. You can imagine the, the amount of stick I got when I drove into the car park. Yeah, you can actually. Why on earth have you done that? Do you know why? Because it's something I believe in. And actually, he kind of revels in the, the quirkiness and, and the difference of it and the fact that he stands out in there. You know, we need pioneers like this. We need people to kind of make a stand and say, actually, that is me because that's what I want to do. And it's not only individuals, it's not only media, but then it's also customers. And that's retail customers, but also fleet customers who can say, I guess, OK, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to join, if you like, this electric a revolution which is happening in the car industry. Because, in conclusion, and I guess I'll skip all of that because I've said most of it in my presentation, but the bottom one there, revolutionary times for the auto industry. This takes us into areas where, as vehicle manufacturers, we're not necessarily comfortable in. We have to talk about kilowatt hours and charging cables and infrastructure and even talk to the government at times. Sorry, Jonathan. Um, but is it, is it hard? Actually, yeah, damn right, it's hard sometimes. And the market's not great. So actually, people say, you know, yeah, what's it like working in the EV industry? And it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant to be involved in something at this stage because I know that in future I'll be proud to look back and say, do you know what? I was there. I was there at the start. So I'd invite you all to drive the cars today because you'll get that real wow factor when you're driving an electric vehicle. And also, do your sums. Don't be afraid to go out and see, actually, is an electric vehicle right for me? It might not be, but you know what? It just might. Thank you very much.